All right. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Pig Daily, guys. Uh, it's Pig here. Today is the 15th of August 2016, and the DreamHack Montreal, aka WCS Summer Circuit Championship Finals, has just finished. So, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, DreamHack. They sent the replays out straight away. Uh, so, I've already got the replays, uh, and we don't have a super well planned daily. But what we do want to look at is the very back and forth and somewhat exciting first game of the. Uh, the best of seven grand final. I won't throw out any spoilers just yet in case you haven't watched it, but this is game one of uh, of that match. So uh, yeah, a um, couple of housekeeping things. First of all, number one, this week we're going to be trying something new with the daily. We're going to be doing very short episodes. I'm aiming for 20 minutes. If it goes to 30 minutes, so be it. I want to do this just for this week, see how it goes, see how it feels. Um, see if there's more people who are able to watch the content and keep up with it. If they enjoy that, and if there's a good response, we'll kind of we might stick with it. We'll see how it goes. It's just experimental. I just want to see how it goes. So uh, yeah, let's dive on into game, guys. Let's not dilly dally and uh, and let's take a look. All right. So this was map number one here. Um, you know, I'm just going to turn my overlay off for this one, just because we are using this overlay, so we can go forwards and backwards as much as we need. And spawning down here in the bottom right hand side, we have Polt. <laughs> Our red Terran player. Thank you very much for that sub. Gotta make sure I uh, make those notifications a little bit smaller. There we go. And his opponent up here, of course, is True. So this is the grand finals of uh, of DreamHack. Um, and it is a very... I, th I think it's a match where a lot of people weren't really sure how it would go. And it was very interesting because True has just... Just this mad, crazy Ling Bane all over the place style, where it's very much around mixing very all in play with very greedy play. True is a player who identifies the strength of Zerg Ling Bane Ling and really kind of looks to bounce between the extremes of aggression and greed very drastically, and that's what makes him such a frightening player to play against. He combines that with relentless counter attacks and a very good knowledge of how to pull his opponent's attention one way while hitting somewhere else. And all of that does does make True very difficult to play against. Now, that was actually a really nice pick off by that Reaper. Getting that single drone early on is huge. And behind this, Polt is just doing what we call the 2 one, one. Second barracks nice and early. Goes down usually even before the second depot. Then the factory. Second gas as well, of course. Uh, so it's basically just a standard Reaper expand and then going to be going into that very fast double medevac stim timing. Now, what's interesting about this game, and we will kind of... Th this was actually really cute by True. This was, this was really good. And I wonder if this, this kind of put pressure on Paul because he's, he makes a lot of mistakes early on this game. And that's why the fact that it was kind of as close as it was, I found all the more impressive. We do get to see Paul kind of crisis manage pretty well throughout this game. Um, while I feel like a lot of things go right for True, and yet he still has a tough time finishing him off. So, the big thing here, we'll fast forward to it. So True's just kind of doing a very safe, uh, you know, Overlord speeds on the way, I can scout exactly what's going on, sees the reactor, sees the fact, uh, the starport timing, kind of knows what's up. And it's just going to be going for that, you know, not super fast third on the goal, double Evo chain, but very typical Ling Baneling opening. Um, off just a single gas. Keeps mining that single gas the whole time, so he doesn't even need a second gas. And he can just saturate all three mineral lines and defend with just queens and zerglings early. Really efficient. Now, here is where we see the biggest mistake of the game. And this is one of these moments where, I mean, some of you Pulp fans might have seen this happen um, on the production tab. I don't think the Observing caught it, because why would you be staring at the production in the middle of the fighting? But this was... This was so sad. This was heartbreaking watching this. So what happens here is something we've seen Polt actually do previously in a um, in a, a show match. Uh, when we had him on What If Wednesdays against uh, Hydra, he said since then, he I think he changed the hotkey or something like that. Or he, he, he did something to make sure it wouldn't happen again. But here we see a horrible mistake by Polt. Swaps his production and then accidentally. So let's let's watch how that happened. Let's watch from Pult's camera so we can see exactly what he's clicking on and we're going to slow it down. So he's micring his Reaper around. Alright, let's start our deeper wall without a natural. And he's going to swap the starport and factory. Fantastic. 
And then somehow he's lifted his barracks. And this is this is what I find so fascinating. Like, what has actually happened here? Because like I, I I honestly don't understand how he lifted these barracks. He's selected the factory, selected the starport. And there we go, he selected his barracks and he tried to build marines and he's accidentally hit his lift button while looking at the reaper. And what that did was that cancelled stim. Stim was halfway done and this whole build order is based around two medevacs coming out at the same time as stim. So this was a huge mistake. Uh, I'm sure Polt was, was hating himself for that. But what we do see here from Polt is really interesting crisis management. He immediately realizes, shit, my stim is going to be really late. And let's look at how he changes things up. Now, this is not necessarily the most efficient, perfect way to do it. But on the fly, he says, shit, I don't have anything to do with my two medevacs. I'm not going to go across the map until stim's ready. Like, it's, it's, I'm just not going to do it. Instead, he cancels these two medevacs and then drops the third command center and the double engineering bay immediately. His Reaper scouts at the same time, checks there's no all incoming, he sees a lot of drones, he says, yeah, okay, okay, I know there's a third, I know there's a lot of drones. And only now does he start up those two medevacs. So that was a really cute adjustment. It's still though very, very bad for Polt. And I mean, most Terran players would say this is almost GG when this happens. This is so bad, it can mess you up so much. You can also see he kind of cuts marine production here. He says, look, I've got 15 marines. 14 and uh, you know 15th about to pop with the medevacs that's enough to go pressure let's start building more reactors he's basically saying i just need to power up in that production power up in that economy these upgrades and if i can do that then that will work out really well for me so back on the other side let's swap over to true's vision for just a moment i will turn that follow those follow alerts off very quickly i just realized i've got those on <laughs> my bad guys um, <clears throat> there we go. Cool. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is going to be coming across this map, this double medevac, and it's so delayed. Now keep in mind, this normally hits at five minutes, 20. What did we, let's, let's take a look at what true has at five minutes, 20. So normally that's when the stim hits. The Marines are all unloaded. They're stimming in to kill your stuff. True has nine Zerglings and five Queens. What the hell? True has been so greedy. Fully saturated base, fully saturated base, fully saturated base. Like he has so much mineral income, it is disgusting. And this is partly because he's been crazy greedy. And I really think this is this is this shows True's just spectacular ability to react under pressure. So check this out. At this point, most Zerg players would be like, it's hitting in 40 seconds, mass Zerglings, mass Zerglings. True's like, yeah, I've got four queens, i got a couple zerglings. But what he has is overlord speed and this overlord at the front. And you can actually see him notice everything that goes on in this natural. He sees the command center go down quite early, so already he's like, oh, well, it's definitely not an all-in follow-up behind the attack. Like, there's not going to be big pressure right behind it, even though he knows it's probably that medevac attack. At least I think he does. Uh, unless he misread the play and this was accidental greed, which is actually a possibility since he only saw the reactor in the starport. He could be thinking it's just like a widow mine drop into Tankovac, which you don't need as much defense against. Then he sees the eBays, and most importantly, he has eyes on the Marines. And any other player seeing all those Marines right now would start massing Zerglings. But I don't know if True has some magical star sense or he was just playing a little bit ballsy. But True said to himself, you know what, I can just keep droning right now. And, and to me, this is a little bit mad. Um, in the grand finals to, to drone this hard. But at the same time, it ended up being perfect. And what I'm guessing True was saying is, you know what? I do so many Ling Bane all-ins, and like it's very common in the meta for Ling Bane all-ins to hit the natural wall right as that medevac drop leaves. I reckon my opponent's going to be a little bit afraid. I think Pult's going to be scared of those options, so I'm not going to build defensive units until I see these medevacs pick up and leave the base. So right at this moment, True's like, oh, okay, run the Overlord away. He's going he's gonna to shoot this down. Overlord buys a bit of time, though, just by forcing those Marines to unload. And now we see 20 Zerglings in production, more Queens constantly building up, going, wants to go up to, you know, six or seven Queens to help buffer that. And that's really interesting because this is something you normally wouldn't recommend. But True's made this assessment, and I really feel like it comes down to the fact that, like I said, you know, he does so many counters, so many all-ins, players tend to play more careful against him. They play a little bit safer against him.
Now there's a few people in chat, Eon Blue for instance, saying, you know, I think True just waits for those Marines to move out. You know, I, I think that's just what he does. The thing is, most Zerg players will tell you that's really greedy. And the reason that is so greedy is because those medevac, that, those medevacs, if they boosted straight across the map, they get over here in about 30 seconds. You only have time for one production cycle. Now, what if that happens right as those, those uh, injects have just been spent on drones? Suddenly, you've got to wait another 20 seconds and then you can finally, finally build those units. And by the time it happens, you've got 20 Zerglings out, maybe 30 Zerglings at most, and 16 Stim Marines, if, if there's only 5 Queens supporting them, uh, the Zerglings can actually, you know, the, the Terran can easily win that fight. So it's definitely something where True towed, towed that line of greed, but it did work out for him really well. And this trade here is actually great for True, because Terran never wants to lose their pressure. Both Medivacs going down, all these Marines, this is really bad for um, Pult. But let's go back and let's look at, at True's defense there very quickly. So what's really smart here is True sees where he's coming from, look at this, and he even runs his overlords away manually. And look at how he spreads his defense out. Now what True says is, I want to keep spreading my creep. Normally all the Terran wants to achieve from this is force a lot of units to be built and stop the creep spread. However, if the Zerg is like, nah, I'm going to have my units right out front on top of my creep, I'm not going to let you deny this. A Terran will often say, you've got too many units at the front, that gives me an opportunity to dive into the main. So what we see here is True leaves just two queens in the main base and a couple queens at the front and brings the Zerglings to the front as well and almost tries to shepherd these drops into that main. We see the Zerglings come down here already just saying, oh, those Marines are a little bit spread out. You know what? I can jump on top of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy some time and being so ballsy as to go and look for a counterattack with these Zerglings. So True here just making use of that uh, that income straight away, shepherds these into the main, and the deeper the medevacs come, the less chance there is to escape. That extra range on these queens really allows Zerg to benefit if they can get the Terran to commit in between their bases. Suddenly even these two queens potentially could have moved those over here and sniped these down. So this was a really cute maneuver by, um, by True. As it is, you know, Polk comes in here, tries to fight, and it kind of looks like he's going okay, but the moment those medevacs die, it's like, oh, that's not very good. And Zerglings denied mining on the third at the same time. So True was just doing lots of things really well. Keep in mind, Polt lost so much momentum early on because he wasn't able to hit his timings. So the fact that he is actually withstanding this huge swell of Ling Baneling was very well done by him. Just splitting off part of his units to chase these Zerglings. And he's going to lose a few marines up there, but very quickly pulls the SCVs. And notice he's using this choke point as his fallback zone. These Widow Mines in that choke point. Of course, if the rocks die, they'll kill them. But uh, outside of that, this is like a really good area. If the Ling Bane runs through here, obviously, you know, the Widow Mines Marines are going to gun them down really hard. So let's fast forward from here. There's a Zergling drop in the main at the same time. Polt just on the ball with quickly grabbing units from his rally and what's popping out and reacting to this sort of stuff. He's actually done a really good job. Now, this is something you should always do once your opponent shows they want to drop. You just grab a bunch of marines, put them on a separate hotkey, or don't even hotkey them at all. We see Pop puts them on number three. And then he says, actually, you know, it's time to go dropping. I need that, that hotkey. Instead, let's just put the medevacs on that. And he actually pulls his marines away from the edge of the base, just relying on that depot to spot, and then just react when he sees units coming in. Of course, something which you're going to see here from Pult, which a lot of players skimp out on and sometimes forget, is also constant Widowmine production. Uh, and in, this is a, a Pult specific one, is a second factory here, and this is also an anti-true uh, adjustment. Something Pult doesn't do as much these days, though he did it a lot in the early beta. Oh, Baneling Drop came in right there. So what's really cool here, right, from Pult's point of view though, is he gets, goes for this second factory, and he's going to go for um, Tunneling Claws. And he's just going to build a hell of a lot of Widow Mines. Because he knows that True likes to stay on Ling Bane a long time. But not only that, True does not go for that fast a Hive. And even when he gets Hive, he doesn't focus on Ultras as much as other Zerg players. He's more focused, because there's such a delay on the Ultras coming out and actually being powerful. True's a guy who loves to just invest in more Zerglings, more Banelings, Infestors, Roaches, and... Adrenal Glands is the one upgrade he always makes the instant his Hive finishes. He is obsessed with this upgrade. 
because he's such a Zergling counter-attack based player. So he really plays it to his style. And this is this is just very intelligent, right? So Polt actually adjusted to that, said, you know what, normally mass Widowmine production is not that good. If you ever hear someone say Widowmines are good versus Ultralisks, they're just flat out wrong. Uh, they're not the worst thing against them. Obviously, you know, it does what? 125 damage. You know, you don't really care about armor when you're doing 125 damage, especially considering I'm pretty sure it's spell damage. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure it's spell damage, which means armor doesn't even affect it. Um, the more important thing, though, is the fact that, like, you can have three Widow Mines per supply per Ultralisk. Then, then like, they're going to take half its life off. They're not good against Ultras. Once Ultras come out, Widow Mines are not very useful, um, especially because the Ultras are so big that when a Widow Mine hits an Ultralisk, it doesn't splash onto many other units because the Ultralisk takes up most of that splash area itself. Now... What's interesting though is Polt says because there's going to be an elongated mid game where you're sticking on these mid tier units where Widow Mines are actually useful, I'm going to have a window to build Tunneling Claws, make use of it, make use of triple Widow Mine production, and actually, you know, get the value out of that. Whereas most players wouldn't opt for this, or I'm pretty sure even Polt wouldn't opt for this against most players, simply because most Zergs will rush to Hive, rush to Ultras, and the moment the Ultras are out, it's like, cool, I just got Tunneling Claws, I just got to like 12 Widow Mines or some crazy count. Now they all don't do that much. In terms of True's composition, let's also take a step back before these big mid-game engagements start, and let's have a very quick talk about the composition. Why are there Roaches here? What the hell are they all about? So let's go back just a little bit earlier. And we see Roach Speed got added in. Uh, like, basically, the Roach Warren went down a little bit before the Hive. Like, probably around the same time the Infestation Pit went down. And four Infestors with Pathogen Glands and ten Roaches come out with Roach Speed. No no other Roach upgrades, just the Roach Speed. Now, what this is, this is, this is kind of like mixed reasons for this. And this is something which I personally think is very inefficient in terms of their ability to help in a front-on battle. In a pitched fight, these roaches, these ravages, this investment, because you're getting roach speed, you're getting the roach warren, and you're only getting 10 of these, it's expensive, and they're not worth it in a big, single, front-on engagement. They're, they're crap. Why is this good? Because True loves his counterattacks. He's constantly dropping banelings behind. He's doing all sorts of counterattacks from different angles. He's buying time. He takes his time. And ravages are fantastic against Widow Mines. So you see this very complex interaction between the two players in terms of, hey, you play heavy Zergling, so I'm going to build a lot of Widow Mines. And then on the other side, True says, you're going to build a lot of Widow Mines. Let's get Ravages. And guess what? Two Ravager Vials knocks a Widow Mine down. If Pult starts to slow push, these Ravagers can actually just snipe the, the Widow Mines. They can run forward, drop Corrosive Vials, kill Widow Mines. Of course, you add to that the fact that Ravagers are a very cost-efficient way of dealing with Liberators later on. And combined with Fungal, they can kind of shut down drops a little bit, especially in big fights. If you ever get a big Fungal on the Metavax, you can really limit that Metavax count. So it's kind of cool to see this interplay of these two styles, right? If you're playing a Ling Bane style, should you just always build Roaches and Ravages to make your army stronger? No, not, not if you're just looking for one big engagement. But if you're someone who wants them to get value later in the game against Liberators, hells yeah. If you're someone who wants to deal with heavy Widow Mines, and you've got the advanced micro to kind of poke in and out with your ravages and, and snipe those down. We don't get to see that too much in this game, but you will you will see it a lot when, uh, for instance, Dark's playing this sort of style in uh, in GSL. In those cases, that's where the ravages actually can gain value. So it's a very specific move uh, which needs high execution to actually work. So you've got this kind of complex interplay. You've got the Ling Bane, just the ten roaches, which are steadily going to morph into ravages as time goes by. Let's take a look at this push here from Polt. So Polt's moving forward, lots of Marines, only a few Widow Mines at this point, but he will be joining up with more of them soon. Um, that's actually a little bit of a mistake. I said some Terran players neglect their Widow Mine production. I think Polt's a little bit guilty of it this time. I think there's been a few more gaps in the factory uh, production than there probably should have been. If you're gonna get Tunneling Claws and uh, a second factory, you, you really wanna make sure you get that. But nonetheless, let's look at how Polt does this. Now Polt, is not happy to be on creep right here. This this is not a situation he enjoys. Great bait on that widow mine, by the way. But because there's choke points, I mean it's really hard for True to flank, for instance. He's got to go all the way around. And then he's still coming through eh, somewhat of a choke. Over here, tiny choke. Can't flank through there. Tiny choke. Can't flank through there. 
So Paul just says, look, if I'm pre-spread here, I've got Widow Mines to like blast you as you come down the ramp. This is a pretty good position. However, already having one Widow Mine baited is a big problem. This is why you normally don't want any Widow Mines in front of your army. You always want to have Marines on top of your Widow Mines so they can't just send forward a few Zerglings and set it off. Let's go back a bit. Let's just watch exactly how Paul did that. Paul actually sent some Marines up behind these gases. Look at that. So just using the high ground, low ground. And he wants to force True to attack into him. He just wants to pick away at the drones and say, you need to attack me, buddy. You need to get in there. And True kind of half engages there. Keeps pulling back, isn't sure about committing in here. And notice Polt there, focus firing on those infestors with his front marines and just maintaining his pre-spread. Meanwhile, Polt did a rather ballsy maneuver and said, you know what, I really don't want to force my way out there, <clears throat> but I know I'm on a timer. And instead of reinforcing the main engage, he just reinforced everything onto the right-hand side. And he's just trying to force True to attack into his pre-spreads, to attack into bad positions. But True, realizing his two-spread hour, says, look, Enough time's gone by, I can just engage this. Rolls over the left-hand side of the army. Loses this hatchery, but it's only a fifth base, so he doesn't care about it. And does repel Polt. And now, he says, I've got room to start 3-3. He's going to start Ultras soon. But he's just got to respread his creep when he can, and uh, he'll be in an okay position. Now, interestingly, quick economy update. How is True playing it? No gas there. Seven gas geysers in total. Even though he's gone to Hive, doesn't get the eighth gas, knows that... Heavy Zerglings, Minerals are the more important thing. And we're going to see these Ravages. There we go. So Ravage is nice and cost efficient way of getting rid of those Widow Mines when you actually realize where they are. And, uh... Pult here, continuing to push. But what we really... What was I, I was really impressed with here is Pult's ability to just stay calm, even in a hard position, and keep poking from two sides. Kept coming in from multiple angles, kept looking for that. But behind this... Polt is very afraid because he assumes Ultralisks must be coming out now. And we see Widowmine production stopping. And this is something where if only Polt had more information, he would have actually known that I don't think the Ultra Cavern, did it just finish? Or has it not even started yet? I don't think it's even started yet. Yeah, there's no Ultra Cavern yet. If he knew that, Polt might continue building Widowmines and continue just pushing with this mid-game composition. But instead, he's swapping to Liberator production and while he's still building a lot of marines, he's definitely going to be thinking about getting a lot more marauders out. And I really feel like this is just a mechanical error, accidentally building marines out of these barracks. Because just the fact that Widow Mine production has stopped and that Liberators are building tells me that Polt is thinking about Ultralisks and think about being ready for that phase of the game. Of course, that Fungal Bile combo there, finally coming in for True. And um, unfortunately though, True, because Polt was attacking from multiple angles, True started to kind of... Make a few mistakes here. Um, took forever to make an Overseer. Finally starts morphing that. But uh, took a few pretty bad Widow Mine shots. Now, at this point in the game, we see tank production as well. And this is this is where it got really interesting. So, Pulp decided to swap to double factory siege tank, as well as the double liberator production. And this kind of just confused me. I, I really don't know what the point of this was. Uh, I guess tanks can, can kind of do damage to Ultras. I don't really feel like they're particularly good at it though. Um, so this is something where I was really curious to see where this would go in a more even game. At this point, I think True has a little bit too much space for himself. He's got that five base income up. And while Pult's trying to maintain pressure, he's not really getting a lot done with it. The creep is starting to respread. There's six bases up for Zerg. And True just looks exceptionally comfortable. And of course, whenever you stop constant bio production, suddenly you're only building tech units and your rally can get overwhelmed quite easily. So uh, this almost ended very poorly for Pult, but a very nice reaction there. And that counterattack actually had the potential to win the game. Now here's the second heartbreaking moment of this game, which unfortunately, unfortunately Pult here, just dealing with so many things at once on the map, didn't repair that base. And kaboom, that was... Such a sad moment. I saw Twitch chat explode. The people going, it's, it burnt down because it actually happened off camera, but you could see it disappear on the minimap. Um, and that's something you, you know, you don't see, you don't see buildings burn down too much. But at this point, True was just hunting down all over the map, respreading creep, the Ling Baneling mix with these ravages kind of just backing it up and the infestors and fungal. 
Uh, True just had so much stuff. And uh, Polk constantly trying to dart in from side to side. But this base here being an orbital, it was something like a greedy move from Polk saying if I keep aggress being aggressive, just having a bit more money rather than having this base be able to defend itself is probably how I'm going to win this game. Because if it ever gets to the point where True attacks here, then I'm going to be screwed. Of course, that choice backfired. Not having a planetary there meant that was so easy for True to just raid the entire mineral line. And, uh, you know, Pult's desperately trying to drop in these bases, but it's just not doing enough. And you can see that he's just kind of lost a little bit too much momentum. He's been afraid of Ultras for so long, but they're only now finally about to join the fray. And, you know, Pult's still on three bases. He's still building two tanks at a time. Um... The interesting thing about tanks in this situation is the tanks will do decently against Zerglings and Banelings, especially as they have plus one weapons now, which means they will always one-shot a Zergling or Baneling, even if it has plus three armor upgrades. Uh, even, even then, you'll still do the 35 damage to one-shot a Zergling. And uh, the Liberators obviously can deal with the Ultras, and the tanks do some damage to the Ultras. The one problem here is just that Pult's so far down in army supply... He's got only a few Marines and Marauders to back this up. He's got man no maneuverability or ability to, to kind of deal with counterattacks. He he's just hoping that True will run into one choke point, YOLO on in, and lose his whole force. Which unfortunately is not going to happen. So guys, as we get towards the tail end of this game... Sorry, did I accidentally muted that? Uh, as we get to the tail end of this game, please do shout out your questions in chat. We'll answer one or two questions before we do finish up the video. Um, so shout those out with the at x5 underscore pig tag now, and I will answer those momentarily. At this point, you can see True's got his anti-liberator. And these, the fungal growth provides some anti-ghost. He's already got Ling Bane tech, which is great against ghosts and bio as well. And the ultras, of course, which are good against everything except ghosts and liberators. So True's composition has this really nice kind of segue into the late game where it's like, hey, all these units are actually like built to counter the counter to Ultralisks. So True isn't one of these guys who ends up with Ultras. He has like four Ultralisks out with Chitinous Plating. He's like, I think I can win now, but then the Terran has four Liberators up and Zerg just doesn't have a response and dies. Uh, True's actually like super well prepared for every stage of the game. And I think if you had to identify a weakness, a lot of players would say, well, it's in the mid game. It's relying on that Ling Bane. That really is his problem. Because if you can find the right opening, you know, it's just not as solid. It's hard for Zerg to get enough units out. But what True really is a master of is finding a way to force the, the Terran player to not take advantage of him. Forcing players to be paranoid about what he could potentially throw at them. And uh, also just defending with that Queen Zergling super efficient defense. As I pointed out earlier, every game, True Go you know, he loves that Overlord speed. He loves to see exactly what's going on, so he's got the reliable defense. But he also loves to only stay on one gas. He says, if I'm going Ling Bane Queen, let's just defend with Lings and Queens. Let's have a really efficient economy build up. And as I pointed out earlier, he only adds gas after he's saturated three mineral lines. So at this point, you know, uh, Polt had no economy, and we're going to come back and see some disgusting corrosive bile to finish things off. Oh, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Let's get rid of that production tab. Let's get rid of that name panel. Whoa, the fungal corrosive bile. Goodbye, siege tanks. And uh, from there, you know, it's just a few Liberators and tanks. And uh, True don't care about that. Not at all. Just going to put that on True's camera. Alright guys, so let's answer a few questions while we still uh, look at the tail end of this game. Yeah, Blue says, don't you think it's enough to time uh, to time buildlings as soon as you see the Metavax moving out on Potheosis especially because the map is so large? So that's a really good point, something I didn't touch on at all, Leon Blue, actually, uh, and very intelligent is, yes, on a small map like Frozen Temple, if you start building Zerglings as you see the Metavax leave the base, then that is... Oh my god, that's disgusting. <laughs> Sorry, we got to watch that one again. Um, yeah, on a smaller map, then definitely if you time it out, so that your um, your stuff is only happening right then. 
then things can get really awkward, right? Because you're building your, um, you're, you're building your Zerglings as they come out. Like they're going to get to your base. And the thing is, like I said, it's not just about like, like what if you've just spent all your lava on drones? You might have to wait another 20 seconds before you have lava uh, and so on. I think even here, because there was only five queens out for true in that earlier stage, I still think he was cutting the line pretty close. But because he saw the fast third CC, he's like, oh, there's not, not going to be a crazy follow-up. He saw the eBays. And as you said, I do think that's a really good point. Apotheosis is a really long map. It takes so long to get across that being a little bit greedier, taking advantage of that length of the map, a very smart adjustment by true.